Chapter 2 About halfway between West Tech and New York, the motor road chastely. The motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile. So as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land, they see so many of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into riches and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke. And finally, with a transcendent and fort, a man who moved dimly and ready crumbling through the power of the air. Occasionally, a line of great cars, grows alone and invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash gray men swarm up in late in space and stir up on impenetrable clouds with screens there obscure, offer instructions from your sight. But above the gray land in the spasms of bleak dust which drift and celebrate, you perceive, after a moment, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckerberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckerberg are blue and gigantic. They red and are someone you're high. They look out of no face, but instead, from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over an unexistent nose. Evidently, some wild bag of, of an Oculus set them there to fathom his practice in the bar of Quiz. And then he sank down himself into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many painless days under sun and rain, burden over solemn, burden over the solemn dumping ground. The valley of ashes is bounded on one side by a small bar river, and when the drawbridge is up the left barges through, the passengers and waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt of at least a minute. There is always a heart there of at least a minute. And it, and it was because of this that I forced man come to Cameron's mistress. The fact that he had one of us insisted upon wherever he was known. His open tenses presented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her and leaving her at a table, sat after about, chatting it whosoever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ashes, he jumped to his feet and taking hold of my elbow literally forced me from the car. But getting up, he insisted, I want you to meet my girl. I think he tanked up a good deal at luncheon and his determination to have my company mortared from violence. The super solicitous assumption was that on Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. I followed, I followed him over, over a low whitewashed railroad fence, and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under Dr. Eckerberg's persistent stare. The only building inside was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of the wasteland. One of those, uh, uh, the only building inside was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of the wasteland. A sort of compact main street, ministering to it and contiguous to absolutely nothing. One of the three shops it contained was for rent, and another was an all-night restaurant parched by a tray of ashes. Uh, the third was a garage, repairs, George Wilson, hearts bought and sold, and I followed Tommy's side. The interior was on parched parts and bare. The only car visible was the dust-covered wreck of a fort, which crouched in a dim corner. It had occurred to me that this shadow of a get rich must be a blind, and the sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead when the proprietor himself appeared in the door of an office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. He was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. When he saw us, a damned gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. Hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, swept me jovially on the shoulder. How's business? I can't complain, answered Wilson uncommonly. When are you going to stand in the car? Next week, I've got my man working in now. Works pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. 
and then feel the way your body. Maybe I'd better say it some air as after all. I don't mean that. Explain Wilson quickly. I just meant his voice petted off, and Tom glanced around the around the carriage. His voice petted off, and Tom glanced patiently around the carriage. Then I heard footsteps on the stairs, and in a moment, the thick, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle thirties and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as a human can. Her face, above a spotty dress of dark blue crepe sheen, contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her as if the nerves of her body were continually smartering. She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost. She cast with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you, so somebody can sit down. Well, sure, answered Wilson quickly and went toward the little office mingling immediately the cement color of the walls. A white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his dark and his pale hair, as it veiled everything in the vicinity. Except his wife, who moved close to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intimately. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the low level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs in his hands. In, from his office door. We waited for her down the road and not outside. It was a few days before the 4th of July, and a grace, crony Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Her place is near the Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckerberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't our husband object? Listen, he thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York. Or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred them much sensibility to Tom deferred them much sensibilities of those East Neggers might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown figure of muslin. Which stretched tight over her red or white hips. And as Tom helped her to the platform in Europe. Stand, she bought a copy of Tom Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the drug, in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small scandal magazine of Broadway. Upstairs, in the Solomon Coin Drive, she left for taxi cab's driveway before she started to the new one, lavender color with gray upholstery. And in this, we slid up from the window. Uh, and in this, we slid up from the mast of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately, she turned sharply from the window and leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. Very nice to have a dog. 
We backed up to a grey old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket, swung from his neck, carved a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly as it came to the text window. What kinds? What kind of more lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs. How do I suppose you got the kind? The man peered doubtfully into the basket and plunged in his hand. The man peered The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged in his hand and drew one up, wriggling by the back of the neck. It's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an airtale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rack of the back. Look at the coat, some coat. That's a dog that will never bother you with catching coat. I think it's good, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? A dog? He looked at it admiringly. The dog will cost you ten dollars. The air there. Undoubtedly, there was an air there concerning me as a mayor, though his feet were entirely white. Changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Blissel's lap, where she fondled the wet of her coat with red shirt. Is he a boy or a girl? she asked delicately. A dog? A dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Is there money? Go and buy ten more dogs with it. He drove over to Fifth Avenue, sore and south, almost faster. On the summer Sunday afternoon, the elder had been surprised to see a great flock of sheep turn the corner. Hold on, I said. I have to leave you here. No, you don't. In a post, Tom quickly. Martel will be hard if you don't come up to the apartment, won't you, Martel? Come on, she urged. I'll tell it for my sister, Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who have to know. Well, I'd like to, but... We went on, coming back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at once like in a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regular coming glance around the neighborhood, Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purchases and went hotly in. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator. And of course, I got to call on my sister, too. The living room, the apartments was, the apartment was on the top floor. A small living room, a small dining room, a small living room, a small bathroom and a bath. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestry furniture entirely too large for it, so that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging the gardens of Versailles. The only picture was an over enlarged photograph, apparently a hand sitting on a large rock. Looked at from the distance. The hand resolved itself into a bonnet, and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed down into the room. Several old copies of Tom Tattle and some and several old copies of Tom Tattle. Several old copies of Tante lay on the table together with a copy of Simon called Peter. And some small candle magazines of Broadway. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. 
I looked on the elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added he added on his own initiative a tin of large part of biscuit, one of which apathetically one of which decomposed aptly aptically in the source of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from the last bureau door. I've been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So everything happened. So everything that happened has a dim haze cast over it. Although, the, although until after eight o'clock, the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called her several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, and I went out to buy some at the drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared. So I sat down this in the living room and read a chapter of Simon called Peter. Either it was the terrible stuff or the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. Just as Tom Markle and for the fourth string, Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names. We appeared. The company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, was a slender, worldly girl of about 30, with a solicit kebab of red hair and a complexion powder, Mickey White. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rocky angle, but the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. When she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as the innumerable party bristled, jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in with such a proprietary haste and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived here. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately, repeated my question aloud, and told me that she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Mr. McKee was a pale feminine man from the black below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of dried leather on his chiffon, and he was most respectful in the room. Uh, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artist game, and I get later that he was a photographer and had made a dim enlargement to Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like the octopus on the wall. His wife was shrill, like good, and some horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had forgotten her a hundred and twenty-seven times since they had been married. Mrs. Swisson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream color chiffon which gave out a continuous rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was now converted into impressive of her. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected, moment by moment, and as she expanded the room smaller around her until she seemed to be rubbing on a noisy curtain cable through the smoky air. My dear, she told her sister in a high mincing shout, most of this balance will you tear every time. All they think of is money. I had a woman up here last week to look at my fit and when she gave me the bill, it up does, she and my appendix did out. What was the name of the woman? asked Mrs. McKee. Mrs. Everhart, she goes around looking at people's feet in their own house. I like your dress, marked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. Mrs. Wilson rejected the compliment by raising her eyebrow in disdain. It's just a crazy old thing, she said. I just sleep it on sometimes so that I don't care what I look like. But it looks wonderful on you. If you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If Chester could only get you in the pose, I think he could make something of her. I think he could make something of it. 
We all looked in silence at Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of hair from our eyes and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. Mr. McKee regarded her intently and moved his hand back and forth in front of his face, and moved his hand back and forth slowly in front of his face. I need to change the light, he said after a moment. I need to bring out, I'd like to bring out the modeling of the features and I'd get the hold of all the back hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Miss McKee. I think it's, her husband says she, and we all looked at this object again, whereupon Tom Cannon yelled audibly and got his feet. You McKees have something to drink, he said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before I ever go to sleep. I told the boy about the ice. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiplessness of the lower orders. These people, you have to look, you have to keep after them all the time. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly. And she flounced over to the dog, kissed it in ecstasy and set into the kitchen, implied that a dozen chefs awaiting our orders here. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them in frame downstairs. Toma made it Tom. Two studies. One of them I called Montauk Point, the girls, and the other I called Montauk Point, the sea. The sister Catherine sat down beside me on the couch. Do you live down on Long Island too? She inquired. I live in West Tech. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago at a man named Gatsby's. Do you know him? I live next door to him. Well, they say he's a nephew or a cousin of Casa Wilhelm's. That's where all his money comes from. Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I had to have him get anything on me. His absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. Mickey's pony, suddenly at Catherine. Chester, I think you could do something with her. She broke out, but Mr. Mickey only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. I'd like to do more work on Long Island if I could get the entry. All I ask is that they should give me a start. That's mortal, said Tom breaking into a short shout of laughter as Mrs. Whittenson entered with a tray. She'll give you a letter of over. She'll give you a letter of instruction, won't you, Myrtle? To what? She asked, startled. You give McKee a letter of instruction to your husband, so he can do some studies of him. He slid slow silently for a moment as he invented. George will listen at a gasoline pump or something like that. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear. Neither of them can stand the parson they are married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Marshall and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with them if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. Doesn't she like Bill's neither? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. You see? cried Catherine triumphantly. She lowered, over, she lowered her voice again. It's really his wife that's kicked him apart. She's a Catholic, and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic, and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. When did they get married? Re continued Catherine. They're going west to leave for a while until it blows over. It'd be more of this good to go to Europe. Oh, do you like Europe? She exclaimed surprisingly. 
I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Just let's see here. I went over there with another girl. Do you love? No, we just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. We had over $1,200 when it started, but we got cheated out of it only two days in the private rooms. We had a lawful time getting back, I can tell you. God, how I hated to tell. The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. Then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me back into the room. I almost made a mistake too, she declared vigorously. I almost married the little kite who'd been after me for four years. I knew he was below me. Everybody kept saying to me, Lucille, the man's way below you. But if I had met Chester, he'd have got me sure. Yes, but listen, said Mark to listen. Nodding her head, nodding her head up and down. At least you didn't marry him. I not did. Well, I married him. Said Martel ambiguously. And that's the difference between your case and mine. What did you, Martel? Mandy Catherine. Nobody forced to. Martel Custard. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman. She said finally. I thought he knew something about breeding, but he wasn't fit to link my shoe. You were crazy about him for a while, said Catherine. Cries about him? cried Marto incredulously. Who said I was crazy about him? I never was any more crazy about him than I was about the man there. She pointed something at me, and everyone looked at me accusingly. I tried to show by my expression that I played no part in her in her past. The only crazy I was was when I married him. I mean right away I made a mistake. It Mars might have best to get married in and never told me about it. And the man came after me one day when he was out. He looked around to see who was whistling. Oh, is it your suit? I said. This is a force I ever heard about it. But I gave it to him, and then I lay down and cried to beat the band all afternoon. She really ought to get away from him, resumed Catherine to me. They've been living over in the garage for 11 years, and tell him the fourth sweetie she ever had. The bottle of whiskey. A sick of bomb. Was now in constant demand by our present. Except in Catherine, who felt just as good or nothing at all. So I rang for the janitor and sent him for some slavery sandwiches, which were accomplished so far in themselves. I wanted to get out and walk his door toward the park through the soft twilight. By the time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wide strident arguments which pulled me back. As it reveals into my chair. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed their share of human secrecies to the casual watcher in the darkening street. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. I was in it, I was within it and without, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Marta pulled a chair close to mine, and suddenly her warm, warm breath poured over me the forced to, and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of our forced meeting with Tom. It wasn't the two little facing each other that are always the last ones. Left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. He had undressed it and painted leather shoes, and I couldn't keep my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When he came into the station, he was next to me. And his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I'd have to call the policeman. But he knew I lied. I was excited that. When I got into a taxi, 
I didn't hardly know I wasn't getting into the subway train. All I kept thinking about was, all I kept thinking about over and over was, you can live forever, you can live forever. She talked to Mrs. McKee, and the room rang full of her artificial laughter. My dear, she cried, I'm going to give this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. I'm going to make a list of all the things I've got to do. I've got to make a list of all the things I've got to get. A massage and a wave and a colorful dog and one of those cute little ashtrays. Where you touch a spring. And a reed with plastic bow for mother's grave they will last all summer. I got to make a list so I won't forget all the things I got to do. It was nine o'clock, almost immediately afterward. I looked at my watch and found it was ten. Mr. McKee was asleep on his on a chair with his fist clenched in his lap like a photograph of a man of action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheekbone. I wiped from his cheek. The remains of the spot of dried leather that had worried me all the afternoon. The little, was, the little dog was sitting on the table, looking with wide eyes through the smoke, and from time to time groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, with plans to go somewhere. And they lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in, in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want. Daisy, Daisy, making a short tap movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. And there are bloody towels on the bathroom floor, and women's voices scolding. And high over the confusion, our long broken veil of pain. Uh, Mr. McKee was a for a walk, was a walk from his dose and start in the days or the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene. His wife and Catherine, scolding and controlling as they stumbled here and there among the happy story furniture, uh, among the crowded furniture with articles of eight. And the despairing figure on the couch, bleeding fluently and trying to spread up and trying to spread a tapestry furniture over scenes of Versailles. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door, taking my hat from the chandelier I followed. <laughs> Come to lunch someday, he suggested, as he groaned down the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands up the lever. Snapped the ele elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agree. I'll be glad to. I was standing beside his bed, and he was sitting in the sheets, flat in his underwear. With a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty, beauty and the Beast 
Godliness, all the great story horse, will grand bridge. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold low level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning turbine and waiting for the four o'clock train.